In this video, I'm going to show you how to use JitGLPix and the code box to create Conway's Game of Life. Conway's Game of Life is a simulation of life applied on cells or pixels plus a few rules, which generates patterns, movements, and colors reminiscent of actual cellular-based life forms. These interesting patterns can be used further to create generative art, to create interesting visuals, and running this all on the GPU makes it possible to have very high quality, high resolution Game of Life situations, as well as a less of a hit on the CPU in more complicated patches. This is also going to be an introduction to the code box, so if text-based programming intimidates you a little bit, don't worry, this is going to be fairly simple. Let's begin. I will start by ruining the party a bit by saying that there already exists an object that plays the game of life called jit.conway, which will play Conway's game of life. It does pretty much what we want it to do, right? It receives a video or an image and it's going to run the game of life on that image continuously at a fixed frame rate, which is nice, but there are two problems. So first of all, this runs on the CPU, right? And I want this to run on the GPU. I want this to run on the graphics card so I have higher performance, so I don't have to worry about performance issues when I add this to a larger, more complicated patch. And secondly, I have not created this and I want to create this myself, see how it works, see how I can implement this algorithm on Macs. So I'm going to ignore having seen this JIT Conway and instead I'm going to create a JIT GL Pix, which is going to process the incoming texture pixel by pixel. But of course, since I'm working with textures, I have to always use a JIT world context, right? So I'm going to create a JIT world. I'm going to name it Conway. I'm going to give it the attribute floating one. So the window is always here. And then I can just run it like this. And then I know JitGLPix is going to send out a chat texture and I want to view this by using JitGLVideoPlane, again, as an argument, the name of the context, which is Conway, and the attribute of, let's see, transform underscore reset two. So it always covers the window, no matter what the size. Okay, so let's just randomly put something into JitGLPix. So I will just use JIT.noise, three planes are red, green, and blue float 32 data types, so between zero and one, and let's make the dimensions 100 by 100. Now all I need to do is to connect the button and see what happens. Okay, this is not your video quality, this is actually a bit blurry. So the matrix going into JitGLPix is converted into a texture, it is sent out as a texture, Right now it is unchanged, but all JitGL textures by default have a filter applied to them. So to prevent this, I will create another JitGL texture with the attribute filter none. If I put it between JitGL pix and JitGL video plane, send this again. There we go. Now we actually have pixels that are easy to see. Right, so we can immediately begin thinking of the game of life. I can go into JitGL pix. Uh, I don't really need this default gen patcher. So I have an input and output, and I want to use the code box, right? Uh, which is going to have its own interface to do this processing right here. So we are going to get into code box in a second, but first of all, I want to look at the rules of the game of life, right? So game of life is a cellular automaton or cellular automata devised by the British mathematician, John Horton Conway. So the idea is that we have a system like this where every pixel or every unit is a cell. It looks around, it sees what's out there, and depending on certain rules, it either dies or lives on, or in certain cases, even create children. And these rules result in cool visual patterns, movements of shapes, uh, different shapes, different shapes of different sizes, in certain cases, different colors that resemble life. This is a very primitive simulation of life and this is what makes it so interesting. So we are going to scroll down to rules here and see if we can adapt these rules into the world of JIT GL picks. And the rules seem to be fairly simple. So the universe of Game of Life is a two-dimensional grid of square cells, so in this case are pixels, which have one or two possible states, live or dead. So let's say zero or one. Zero is dead, one is alive. And every cell interacts with its eight neighbors, so it can look left, right, up, down, top left, top right, bottom left, and bottom right. And here are the rules. 
any live cell with fewer than two live neighbors dies, as if by underpopulation, any live cell with two or three live neighbors lives on to the next generation, so the value stays one. Any live cell with more than three live neighbors dies, as if by overpopulation, and any dead cell with exactly three live neighbors becomes a live cell, as if by reproduction. So these are the rules, these four simple rules create the game of life. We can, of course, in the future tweak these rules to see what else happens. But on the Wikipedia page, we can see the uh, condensed rules, which are three rules. Any live cell with two or three live neighbors survives, it stays one. Any dead cell with three live neighbors becomes a live cell, so it comes alive, turns from zero to one, and all other live cells die in the next generation. Similarly, all other dead cells stay dead. So what do I need? Which information do I need to implement my algorithm? So first of all, I need to know the state of my current cell, right? So state of current cell, which is easy because in one is going to be the individual pixel that is being processed by JetGLPix. So whatever the value is, that is the state of the current cell. The next part is a bit more tricky. I need to know the states of neighboring cells. So is the neighboring cell zero or one? What is the sum of the neighboring cells? How many alive neighboring cells do I have? Right, so if I know, and then I just need to apply the rules, uh, we can think a bit more on this later, but it's that simple. So let's think about code box. Now the code box and text-based coding or programming can be a bit daunting if you're not used to that style, but in code box, in the gen environment in Max, it is not so difficult, it works by creating statements, it works by declaring variables, and it works by using the already existing operators or objects inside gen, inside the code box environment. So I can say, you know, I can write the default statement, which was out one equals in one plus in two, and then a semicolon, which we always need at the end of a statement. And this is basically a statement. It says out one is in one plus in two. So there are two inlets here. Now on the code box and one outlet and the outlet is the, the combination, the sum of n1 and n2. I can also declare variables, right? So I can make up words, let's say tomato equals five. Now tomato is five and out one is tomato. I can do things like this, but of course it is unfortunately not that easy. So let's think about looking at nearby cells. Right, so how would I do this in regular JGLPix? Well, I would use the norm object, I would use the dim object, and I would use the sample object, right? Or again, these are also called operators. And what I need to do is to use the sample object's first inlets uh, to choose an input matrix or texture to sample. In this case, this is literally this texture that is coming in. And from the second inlet, I have to pick normalized sample coordinates. So what is the coordinate of the pixel I'm sampling? If the left, if left is zero, if right is one, if top is zero, if bottom is one, what are my Cartesian X, Y coordinates? And to find this, of course, I can use norm, which is going to give me the normalized coordinates of every pixel that is being processed at that moment. And I can find what my step is. Right, so from my current coordinate, let's say I'm here, right, at this red pixel, if I have to go one right, how much do I need to add to my x coordinate value? Or if I want to go to the bottom right, so right and down, how much do I need to add to my x and then y coordinates? To find this out, I just have to get my dimensions, uh, which is going to be, again, a 2D vector, two values, the x and y length of the incoming texture. And I need to divide one by this number. So in regular JGLPix, I would use exclamation mark, uh, the, the division operator, and then one. And doing this would give me, again, a 2D vector, two values packed into a vector that would tell me the smallest step that's possible to go uh, further on the x-axis and also on the y-axis. So I'm going to connect in one here to my code box and I'm going to declare a new variable called pix step. And this will equal to one divided by dim. So it's that simple. If I just write dim here, Jan will already know what it needs to do. And since this is a 2D vector, now I can access the X part, right? I can say pick step dot X, and this is the amount of steps I need to take to move on the X axis. And I can also write 
pick step.y to do the same for the y-axis. Okay, so, so far so good. And then I need to sample a lot of things, right? So let's start by declaring a bunch of variables without worrying about what we are exactly going to declare them as. So let's say I want to have the right neighbor, right? So right equals something, I don't care right now. Left equals something, up equals something, down equals something, uh, top right equals something, top left equals something, uh, bottom right equals something, bottom left equals something. If I exit the code box, it's immediately going to give me an error saying that semicolons are missing here. And also, you know, the statement is not complete, right? So I need to use the sample operator here, but because sample expects input, I have to use it as a what's called a function. So sample and then parenthesis, and I need to put the information in this parenthesis. So first of all, which texture is being processed, which texture is being sampled? Well, that's my in one, right? In one comma. And then the second piece of information, this is where things are going to get a bit hairy. What are my coordinates? So I know, norm is going to give me the normalized coordinates, the current coordinate of the pixel that is currently being processed. And if I add a 2D vector to this, I can move, I can have an offset to the normalized coordinate of the pixel. To declare a vector, I just need to type in vec and then parentheses again. And inside this vector, I can type in my x and y values to be added to my normalized coordinate of my pixel. Right, so to move right, what do I need? I need picks step.x and then the second value is zero because I'm not moving on the y axis. And then to end this entire statement, a good old semicolon. And now I can just copy and paste this whole thing and I can just tweak the parameters here, right? So let's see, to go left, I need to subtract. So I need to add minus picks step x. This is a nice trick that you can do. If you have a variable, you can just put minus at the beginning and it's just going to be flipped. So instead of going one to the right, I'm going one to the left. To go up, I need to not add anything uh, on the x-axis, but on the y-axis, I need to subtract picks step that y. Uh, similarly with down, so I don't add, add anything, picks step dot x. Top right would be I'm going one right and one up, so pick step dot x and also minus pick step dot y. So you see, it's a little bit like a puzzle. You have to figure out which steps you have to take to get all the neighbors. To go to the top left, I have to subtract pick step dot x and then I also have to subtract pick step dot y. And we're almost there to go to bottom right. I add pick step dot x, I add pick step dot y. And to go to bottom left, I subtract pick step dot x and I add pick step dot y. And this, now if I get out of code box, this should look completely normal. And this code is giving me now all the variables with the values of my neighbors. And this way I can actually add all of these values up, add all these values together to see how many neighbors I have, right? So I can make yet another variable called neighbors equals rights plus left plus up plus down plus top right plus top left plus bottom right plus bottom left and this is why we are using the code box here because doing this via the regular gen interface it would be possible but it would also be a lot of work but now we have a variable that shows us how many neighbor a certain pixel has and this is exactly what we can use to apply our rules right here Right, so the state of the neighboring cells, this is completed. So I'm just going to add these nice lines here. I know the state of my current cell, this is also done. And now I just have to apply the rules. And to apply them, I want to use Boolean operators, right? We already have seen these in Mac. So if I say greater than five, and if I send in a value here, the result is either going to be zero or one. One meaning yes. It, the incoming value is larger than five and zero meaning no, the incoming number is less than five. And we can use this, we can use this outcoming value as our output pixel value because what we need at the end is a pixel with either a value of zero or value of one. So I'm not even going to use a bunch of if statements, but I'm just going to take the result of certain Boolean statements. 
you know, this is that way, and this value is larger than this, and this value is less than this, and the result is going to be the value of my pixel. So let's do it like this. I'm going to say out one equals, so now the outgoing value is, let's see, what do I need to check? So first of all, I should know if my cell is alive, right? So if my cell is alive, if n1 is larger than zero, but then I need more, right? So I can use the and operator, which is two and symbols next to each other, which will check if the statement to the left and to the right and other statements are all correct. So if in one is larger than zero, if it's alive, and if neighbors is larger than or equals to two, and if neighbors are less than or equals to three. So this is one big statement. I can pack it all together like this in parentheses to say this is one large statement. And this is not the whole set of rules, but I'm curious what's going to happen if I connect the output here, of course, this is very important. Aha, now when I send this JIT noise, you, you see that the interface has changed. What's happening in the window has changed because we have added part of the rules to one iteration of the game of life. But of course there is more, right? We also have to check if a cell is dead and if it has the right conditions to come back to life. If that is not true and if the cell is not alive and it does not fit the conditions to stay alive, then it's dead, then we don't need to do anything. Then the check is going to give us zero and we will make that the value of the pixel. So I'm after all this, I'm going to use an or statement, which is two straight lines. Again, that might be a bit tricky to type on your keyboard. So do check Google to see how you can write this, uh, write this symbol. But this means or, right? So if the first big statement is not true, it's going to look at the second statement here. And if that is true, it's also going to give us one. If this is also false, then we are going to get a zero, meaning we get a dead cell. So what is the second part of our rules? If the input is dead, right? So if in one is zero, so equals equals zero, which will check if the value is zero. And there we go. And if my neighbors equal three, I can also put this in parentheses to make it look good, but uh, that should be it, That right? That are the rules. So if my cell is alive and it has the right amount of neighbors, it lives, or if it's dead and it has the right amount of neighbors, it also lives. If none of these are true, I get a false, I get a zero, which is the value of my pixel. So let's see what happens here. Okay, sending jit.noise does do something, but of course, each time I bang this, I send out a fresh jitter matrix with bunch of new noise. So we only see the first iteration of the game of life. So we have to do some recursion as well, right? And I already have my texture here. So I'm going to use a trick I used in a previous video, which is to use ZL reg, which is going to hold a list inside until it receives a bank, at which point it's going to send out the stored list, which I'm going to route it to JIT GL picks. So after the first iteration, if I bang this, if I keep clicking, you can see that the game of life is well underway, the, all the cells are moving. And in fact, you might notice that this simulation is happening independently on three planes. So we have a red game of life, we have a green game of life, we have a blue game of life, they're all independent from each other. And of course, instead of clicking this a million billion times, I can just take the second outlet of my JIT world, I can connect it here. And now I get 60 steps per second, which is really cool. This does look very cool. And what's even cooler about this is the fact that we can use a dimension larger than 100 by 100. So what about 1000 by 1000? Whoa, okay, this is really cool. And I can even have a very high definition, 1920 to 1080. I can, if I make this full screen, as you can see, there is no lag. All of this is running on the GPU. This is what the GPU is created for. And we are getting this gigantic game of life, which you can use to do many cool things. We are going to explore a few other avenues in a future video, uh, maybe adding a 3D scene inside the simulation. So what if I have a cube that uh, floats around and uh, the, these pixels are generated from that cube? Or what if we sonify this? What if we get the data? Uh, from this game of life and we give it some kind of musical context to create generative artworks. These are already ideas that you can experience and another cool idea might be to 
explore this code further, try to add some things into it to have a colorful game of life. So to treat each pixel as a single cell, to look at the colors around it, and if a new cell is being born, to adopt its neighboring colors, which might also be interesting. But for now, I'm going to leave this to you. I hope this has been interesting for you. I hope this has been inspiring for you. And thank you for watching.